The Center for Radio and Television, Ball State University, presents the inauguration of John J. Pruce, seventh president of Ball State University. We're speaking from Emmons Auditorium, where you are about to witness the inaugural ceremonies as Ball State University formally acknowledges its seventh president. It is an important day. It marks the climax of some two years of study and consideration toward finding the man most eminently qualified for the exceedingly important position of leading a university, a position of president. This is Dara Weibel, and here in Emmons Auditorium, within the next two hours, the inaugural ceremonies will take place. At this moment, the 75-piece Ball State University Symphony Orchestra is performing under the direction of Charles Alexander Onsbacher, newly appointed director of the symphony orchestra and eminently qualified. Among his accomplishments, he has studied music at Brown University, Northwestern University, Berkshire Music Center, Aspen Music School, and the College Conservatory of Music, University of Cincinnati. Usually, you've seen the orchestra directed by Dr. Robert Hargraves, professor of music and head of the music division at Ball State. Now, the orchestra will continue to perform for about oh, another four or five minutes, at which time the orchestra pit will be lowered and the procession will begin. At this moment, nearby, there are four groups of dignitaries assembled. These include the faculty and administrative officers of the university, delegates of colleges and universities throughout the country, and delegates of learned societies and educational associations, representatives of the alumni and students, and the party of 14, which will occupy the platform. Now our procedure, as we look down across Simmons Auditorium from the vantage point above the balcony, will be to provide you with a brief background of some of the events leading to this day, and of course, the inaugural ceremonies as presented from the platform itself. To briefly recount a few of the historical milestones of Ball State University, we must return to 1899. There were no paved streets in Muncie, Indiana, but there were five businessmen in particular who wanted to establish a college. They were the Ball Brothers. From left to right, they are George A., Dr. Lucius L., Frank C., Edmund B., and William C. Ball. Other businessmen were involved, but the Ball brothers were the principals. The area selected as a site for the school was called Normal City. Articles of incorporation were filed in 1895. The school was called Eastern Indiana Normal University. A building was constructed and dedicated August 28, 1899, a building which serves today as the administration building. The first president was F.A.Z. Kumler, and in addition to having his office in the new building, he and Mrs. Kumler lived there with an apartment on the second floor. The new school closed in 1901, opened the next year under the presidency of one Dr. John R.H. Latshaw's Palmer University, closed again in about a year, opened in 1905 as Indiana Normal School and College of Applied Science. Francis M. Engler was president then. It closed in 1907 for lack of funds, students, and faculty. But in 1912, it reopened under President Michael D. Kelly under the name Muncie Normal Institute. The next year, it was renamed Muncie National Institute. Further financial trouble closed the school in 1917. But that year at public auction, the Ball brothers purchased the 64 acres and two buildings, another had been built since then, and after some six months of red tape, presented it to the state of Indiana. It became the Eastern Division of Indiana State Normal School, Terre Haute, in 1918, and its first president was William Wood Parsons, who was the existing president of Indiana State. Now, President Parsons didn't spend much time in Muncie. Terre Haute was 134 miles away. Transportation in 1917 left a lot to be desired by today's standards. In 1921, the new president was Linnaeus Neil Hines, and the name was changed to Ball Teachers College. President Hines served until 1924, at which time he was succeeded by Benjamin Jackson Burris. Three years later, 1927, Lemuel Arthur Pittenger was named president. 
He had been a faculty member in 1905, served as Ball State president for some 15 years. And it was during his administration that Burroughs Laboratory School was constructed. And it was opened in September 1929. That same year, the name was changed to Ball State Teachers College. President Pittenger was succeeded in 1943 by Winfred E. Wagoner, who was designated acting president. He was to serve for some six months originally, but the State Teachers College Board didn't name a successor until May 1945. And the successor they named was Dr. John R. Emmons. President Emmons officially accepted the position on May 24th, 1945. That fall, there was a total of 1,010 students in Rose Bowl State. He retired in 1968 after some 23 years. And his successor is Dr. John J. Pruce, a central figure in these inaugural ceremonies. And so Ball State has made great strides over the years. It became a university on February 8, 1965. There's a different look to the newly remodeled original building, the administration building. And the beneficence of the five Ball brothers has had a profound effect, which may be measured only by time. To the west of the administration building, five stately columns rise in a memorial appropriately designated beneficence. And so from the small assembly hall of the first building, we move across campus to the northeast in Emmons Auditorium and to a new day, a new era, the inauguration of John J. Pruce, seventh president of Ball State University. We have two television cameras here in Emmons Auditorium. One is on stage, looking out over the audience. You're looking down on the stage from our top camera at the present time. The other camera, the one you're seeing right now, is located in the first row of the balcony. This is the first time that television cameras have been used in beautiful Emmons Auditorium, and the Center for Radio and Television at Ball State University is proud and privileged to record this historic event. To describe the auditorium seating arrangement for today's occasion, we may now, if we look out from the platform toward the audience, there are six aisles and five seating sections as the processional is underway. Beginning with the one furthest from our stage camera, way over on the far side, the front rows are reserved for student leaders. The section next in line has the first eight rows or so reserved for press, radio, and television, news cameras, and they're all set up and waiting down there. And behind them, there are approximately seven rows reserved for student leaders. Student leaders being, of course, presidents of fraternities and sororities, this kind of thing, various campus organizations. Extending back another seven rows or so are friends of Dr. Proust and the Proust family. And the center section, extending from the front row to the very last row, all the way back, are the delegates representing the oldest university to the youngest. And then, of course, and directly below our stage camera is the section reserved for university faculty. There are some 21 rows in that area. We see uh, down below us here the various colors designating the schools as the processional continues, the delegates and faculty members continue to file. There are some 21 rows in that faculty area, and behind the faculty are friends of the university, state and local officials. If we look down now, from above on the fifth and last section. We see there that the areas regarded for uh, faculty families and emeritus faculty, all the other seats from that point are open to students, staff, and public, anybody who wants to attend. Now, as far as the stage itself is concerned, we have a total of uh, seven seats on either side of the lectern up there on the stage. A total of 14 seats for the principals in the inaugural ceremonies. And behind them, of course, are seats reserved for the uh, university concert choir. Well, some uh, two years ago, when it became apparent that John R. Emmons would retire in 1968,
University Senate through its agenda committee sent a recommendation to the Board of Trustees. The Senate recommended that a committee be established to explore the necessary qualifications which a new president should have, to study those qualifications, to seek out those men who would seem to make a good president, to learn as much about them as they could, and finally to submit a small list to the Board of Trustees which in turn would select the new president. The Board of Trustees accepted the University Senate recommendations for a procedure. It was decided to establish a committee of 11 with one representative for the Alumni Association, one for the department heads, one for central administration representing the deans and vice presidents, one for each of the colleges, and for three members to be selected at large. These were selected by the Board of Trustees. We think it appropriate now to acknowledge that committee and its effort. First of all, as the processional continues, we'd like to acknowledge Dr. Merrill C. Byrell, Vice President for Student Affairs. Dr. Helen M. Cloyd, Associate Professor of Accounting representing the College of Business. Dr. Everett W. Farrell, Chairman of the History Department representing the College of Science and Humanities. Dr. Robert Hargraves, head of the Division of Music, representing the College of Fine and Applied Arts. Dr. M. Curtis Howard, principal of Burris Laboratory School, representing the Teachers College. Dr. Alan Huckleberry, chairman of the Department of Speech, representing the department heads. Dr. Robert Linson, director of alumni relations, representing the alumni. Dr. Thomas R. Mertens, professor of biology and Miss Laura M. Schroeder, Special Assistant Professor of Elementary Education at Burris Laboratory School, and Dr. J.C. Wagner, Vice President for Business Affairs and Treasurer of the University. Dr. Mertens, Miss Schroeder, and Dr. Wagner were selected as at-large members. And of course, Dr. Robert H. Kanker, Dean of the Graduate School, who did a fine job as Chairman of the Presidential Committee. Briefly now to recount what the committee did as our procession continues. It met about once a week for more than a year. Each faculty member of the university was asked to submit any names of those who might make a good president. A similar request was made to the alumni through the alumni bulletin. They wrote letters to all the major accrediting agencies and learned societies and to the presidents of major universities in the nation. They explored possibilities in major government agencies, areas of foreign service, medicine, and law. After a time, they had a list of some three to four hundred eligible names. And after considerable study, the list was reduced to about a hundred, and then on down to thirty or so. The committee members, working quietly and trying not to be obvious about what they were doing, visited the potential candidates, talked with them, Finally, each candidate was invited to visit Ball State University as a list of those qualified began to shrink further. Some 10 or 12, we are told, visited here. The committee proceeded to learn more about each man. In a three to four hour oral interview, they rolled up their sleeves and fired questions. And finally, a very small list of names, as requested, was submitted to the Board of Trustees. The Board then selected the new president of Ball State University, John J. Bruce. Ball State University Symphony Orchestra continuing as you look into the orchestra pit down below. We are originating both radio and television through the center facilities of Ball State University, Center for Radio and Television here, describing the inaugural ceremonies. The procession, when it is completed, the final group of people who close this part of the ceremony will involve the, the 14 individuals who will move to the platform and when this group of 14 attains its position, then we will proceed with the events of the day. The entire parking area, normally reserved for student use to the north of Emmons Auditorium, is reserved for visiting dignitaries and delegates today. Campus police were out early this morning. They were on the job before 7 in force. Some other notes of interest here. On the stage itself, back behind the, the principal 14 seats which are involved, the, uh, the concert choir is, is waiting. 
and they are uh, in semi-darkness at the present time, and we'll be able to see them later on, but they are below the Ball State University emblem, which you saw earlier, and located to the back of the stage. Uh, this uh, this uh, very fine choir is directed by Dr. George W. Corwin, a director of choral activities, 36 voices. Uh, he took the choir on a successful Eastern tour this year, which included a concert in Town Hall in New York City. And there you see the man who was conducting a Ball State University Symphony Orchestra. 75 pieces there on the orchestra pit as our camera looks down to them. Charles Alexander Ansbacher, whom we referred to uh, earlier in the broadcast. The procession continues now as we wait for the final faculty members and the final party of 14 to come along. I have this in the way of a kind of a sad note that some of you friends of Ball State University might remember. A former dean of women at Ball State University, 87-year-old Dr. May Klippel, died yesterday in a nursing home at Liberty, Indiana. Dr. Klippel began teaching at Ball State's predecessor, Indiana Normal School, Eastern Division in Muncie, 1921. Had a long, successful career, retired in 1947. Now that some of you are saddened to hear this, but Dr. May Klippel will be remembered here by many, 87 years of age. Looking at some other notes concerning today's program, I might go down the agenda to give you an idea as to what we might expect. We have, of course, as the total master ceremonies, The chairman of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Alex Bracken. I'm going down the list here. Following the processional music, we will have uh, Dr. Bracken introduce uh, Mr. Earl Vaughn, Reverend Earl Vaughn, pastor of the Walnut Street Baptist Church, president of the Delaware County Ministerial Association. He will give the invocation. Now the, the lights have come up on the stage, and you can see that uh, choral choir, perhaps, we referred to earlier. Now the, the 14 chairs are about to be filled as the principals involved there make their way uh, to their positions. The Board of Trustees is now before Ball State University in, in beautiful new cardinal and black robes here for today's occasion. The last two that you see moving uh, uh, to the, the center aisle of the area will be, of course, Dr. John J. Proust and the uh, chairman of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Alex Bracken. And now very quickly the proceedings will be underway and we'll be taking you to the platform to hear uh, what is said down there. Now you're seeing Dr. Proust as he is a principal in today's inaugural ceremonies. <clears throat> Dr. Z. Earl Vaughn, the pastor of the Walnut Street Baptist Church and president of the Delaware County Ministerial Association will give the invocation. The audience, please rise. Thank you. Shall we pray? O loving God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for spring. Thank you for every living thing. Thank you for the whole of creation. Thank you for this great institution of learning. Thank you for our state, for our nation. Thank you for our place of service in the world. Thank you for the life, the devotion, the ability, and the willingness of John J. Pruess. Thank you for the position of president of Ball State University. Thank you for the wedding of this man and this position. Bless and prosper, O God. Give health and strength, wisdom and mercy, vision in the task that is set before him. May he be led by a childlike faith, a Job-like patience, sensitive to the needs of men, seeing beyond the ability of man to a possibility in God. Spurred on by the challenge set before him, may he be directed by your holy presence, assisted by students, faculty, 
administration, board members, alumni, legislators, and friends to do your will. Bless his wonderful wife, Angie, these fine boys, Dave and Dan and Dirk, minister to their every need. And now, O oh God, forgive us of all of our wrongdoings. Continue with us in all the activities of this day. Open our mouths and let us gladly bear thy warm truth everywhere. In the name of our blessed and eternal Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Governor Whitcomb, President Proust, President Emeritus Ammons, members of the Board of Trustees, members of the Proust family, officials of the national, state, and local governments, distinguished delegates and guests, faculty members, students, alumni, and friends of Ball State University. We deeply appreciate your presence today and the opportunity for us to share in this memorable occasion in the life of Ball State University, the installation of John J. Proust as its seventh president. Representing Ball State's near 15,000 students is Thomas Crock, <clears throat> Monticello Sr., who is president of the student body, a student leader with concerns for the welfare of his fellow students, Mr. Crock has demonstrated through his four years of student leadership, unusual wisdom and perseverance in pursuing these goals. Last year, he was junior class president, and this past summer, he directed the Student Orientation Corps program, which helped all new freshmen and their parents become acquainted with Ball State in a personal way. A member of Blue Key, his name has appeared in the last two volumes of Who's Who in American Colleges. It is my pleasure to introduce to this audience Tom Crock, who will speak and present greetings from the student body. Tom. Thank you, Mr. Bracken. Honored guests, students, and faculty of Ball State. It is truly an honor to extend this welcome to Ball State to President Proust on behalf of the students of this university. Only a year ago, Ball State's 50th anniversary was celebrated in a national conference here on emerging universities. It is altogether fitting that the leadership of Ball State in this period of emergence should be entrusted to a man as young and personable as Dr. Proust, a man who has college-age students himself. For students, the concept of the university and its governance has changed drastically in recent years. Viable and significant student participation in university policy formulation is today a good and necessary step. And at Ball State, another symptom of the growing pains of the emerging university. Dr. Proust, in the short time he has been here, 
has given every indication of allowing us to continue that growth, and we welcome this assurance. Despite the change in the attitude about campus governance, however, the university president's desk still remains for students the place where the buck stops. The responsibilities of the presidency grow as the problems of funding and public relations become greater. And yet for students, the university president remains the symbol of the administration and university relationship towards students, and it is his presence that so often determines the reciprocal attitude of his student body. The influence of the university president on the students cannot and must not be underestimated. A willingness on the part of the president to recognize and develop responsible student activism will be the greatest asset toward relevant education that a university and its students can have. Those students who have had the opportunity to work with Dr. Proust this year will agree with me, I believe, in saying that he has proved to be personable and sympathetic to student complaints. It always amuses me to see the wonder of those students who discover for the first time how really easy it is to see the new president. Even before the beginning of school in the fall during the orientation program in the summer, Dr. Proust demonstrated a real interest in student programs. It's an exciting thing for a university to have a new president. An emerging university in itself can be an exciting place. Dr. Proust's coming to Ball State ushers in what promises to be a dynamic era for students, faculty, and their university community. It's a real pleasure for us to be in on the beginning of this era. On behalf of the student body, Dr. Proust, we welcome you to Ball State. Thank you very much, Tom. Dr. Alan Dean Spiker, an outstanding Ball State alumnus, is the assistant superintendent of the Highland, Indiana Public Schools. Widely known in scholastic journalism circles, Dr. Spiker has been active in the Indiana High School Press Association and the Columbia Scholastic Press Association. A former Highland High School journalism teacher, he was named Ball State's Outstanding Journalism Graduate in 1963 and was director of the university's first annual high school journalism workshop in 1966. He earned his Doctorate of Education degree at Ball State in 1967. Speaking for the Ball State Alumni Association and its more than 30,000 members, I am happy to present to you the alumni president, Dr. Alan Spiker. Thank you, Mr. Bracken. President Proust, visiting dignitaries, and members and friends of the Ball State family, I bring you salutations and the very best of good wishes from Ball State's 30,000 plus alumni. It is a great honor for me today to represent Ball State alumni who I am sure share my, enthusi my enthusiasm for this occasion. Such historical occasions as this one come but seldom for institutions like ours. So I would like to take this particular opportunity to make some observations and some commitments to you, President Proust, on behalf of our alumni body. Most causes prosper best when there is a tie across the generations, keeping faith with the past, keeping step with the present, and presenting a promise for posterity. It is in this promise for posterity that the alumni movement must come alive if universities like Ball State are to reach their full potential. The function of the alumni program is to keep the university alive in the minds and hearts of alumni, to keep the institution as a creative force in the daily existence of those who started their careers on this campus. President Proust, on behalf of the Ball State Alumni Association, I would like to pledge one, to give to you our individual and collective support in these very difficult times in higher education, to perpetuate and strengthen the ties of affection and esteem formed in our college days, to explore with members of your faculty and administration 
new methods that alumni might use to interpret the needs and the potential for service to Ball State University, to give programs of academic excellence the highest of priority for fundraising activity, and to promote the interest and welfare of Ball State University in all possible ways. It is said that man looks forward with smiles and backward with sighs, and it is our rare opportunity now to turn full circle and wish you well as we look down the years ahead, knowing that you will reflect well on a glorious past. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan. Widely known and, <clears throat> excuse me, and respected for his annual evaluations of economic conditions in East Central Indiana, Dr. John Hannaford, head of the Department of Economics, is a much sought after speaker who brings his scholarship, his sensitivity to urban problems and, his hum and the human plight, and his wise judgment to his lectures. Dr. Hannaford is the author of several studies on and books on economics and urban problems, a member of the Ball State faculty since 1950. Dr. Hannaford is a graduate of Wabash College and holds the Master and Doctorate of Philosophy degrees from Harvard. As president of the Ball State University Senate, he speaks today in behalf of the faculty and the administrative staff. Dr. Hannaford. Dr. John J. Pruce, at this time of moral crisis in our universities, the faculty is honored to have you accept an invitation to be president of Ball State. Ralph Hemstead, a former president of the American Association of University Professors, once said that a college professor was someone who thinks otherwise. The faculty who will test your patience welcomes you. And the state that will under-support you welcomes you. <laughs> and the students who will challenge your capacities welcomes you. With such friends, you have no need for enemies. <laughs> the babies of the boom of the 1940s are drinking, driving sports cars, smoking pot and heaven knows what else, rejecting soap, shears, and traditional clothing, fighting and dying in a marathon Vietnam War, dubious about the moral sincerity of university faculties and presidents, distrustful of anyone born before World War II, selflessly going out as Peace Corpsmen and Vista workers, hurt and angry over the plight of black men in our society. Ashamed that poverty and moonshots are on the same front page. Rejecting of the civilizing older arts and turned on by the psychedelic newer arts that insult the eyes and ears of their elders. Disrespectful of the traditions they have inherited. Convinced that the received sexual doctrine is passe. Impatient with the machinery of change and allege that the game of life is played with loaded dice. To generalize, our students, like our society, are adrift in a sea of moral uncertainty, trying to make a new set of charts for a new and changing world. No man can know the outcome of the moral crisis to which the universities are called on to find a solution. But when it is all over, when university life returns to some norm, and heaven knows what that norm will be, the solution reached to the problems will be solutions to much more than university and college folkways and forms of life. The solutions to university problems will be the moral modus operandi of society. The new moral structure of the university will be transmitted as the moral norm for man. Welcome, President Bruce, to the leadership of this quest for what is right and good in a changing world. We are honored that you're willing to expose yourself to our friendship.
And there you see the president of, or not the president, but the man representing Harvard University, 1636, say, yeah, Wesley Asbury Dunn. You've identified my station, at least, not only World War II, before World War I. I don't know how that. <laughs> However, I think when one gets back that far, um, it should, uh, perhaps this is a plus rather than a minus. Is that right? Anyway, I'm going to keep on. <clears throat> Almost four years ago, the Vice Chancellor for Student and General Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh decided to return to the Midwest to accept the presidency of Ball State's distinguished sister university, Indiana State University at Terre Haute. Indiana State and the state of Indiana have been the richer for his move. A man of great energy and creative imagination, President Rankin has contributed much to higher education in Indiana during his relatively short tenure here. One mark of his leadership and administrative ability is the fact that he speaks to us today as the president of the Indiana Conference of Higher Education, which, as I'm sure you know, is an organization composed of all of Indiana's private church-related and state-assisted colleges and universities. So to bring us greetings from the Indiana Conference of Higher Education, I have the distinct pleasure of presenting to you Dr. Alan C. Rankin. Dr. Rankin. Thank you, Mr. Bracken. Governor Whitcomb and trustees of Ball State University, President and Mrs. Pruce, faculty, students, and friends of Ball State, and I must add, President Emeritus Emmons. When I sat down after church last Sunday to prepare for today, it was Easter Sunday, and my thoughts were divided between the meaning of events 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem and events today in Muncie. And I was struck by the parallels and contrasts between the city of God and the community of education. To describe our contrasting responsibilities, we can even use the same words. The church should comfort the afflicted, while President Proust and those of us in education should afflict the comfortable. There are many parallels for President Proust to look forward to. Take the trustees, for example. The trustees now call his name Wonderful Counselor. <laughs> but the Bible reminds us that the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears <laughs> and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Take comfort, John. If God be with us, who can be against us? On occasion, he may observe students who, like sheep, have gone astray. He will hope that at faculty meetings, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. He will have days when the thought of another committee meeting will seem like a crucifixion, but if so, he will not rise from the dead on Sunday. It will take at least until Monday. Many in this audience are better able than I to pursue, to pursue these parallels and contrasts, but they would agree, I believe, that ancient Jerusalem in its Easter ceremony and modern Muncie in this inaugural ceremony both symbolize a time of joy, a freshening of faith, a renewal of purpose, and a sense of high hope and opportunity. The poet Emily Dickinson has compared the infinite with the human mind, which after all is our primary purpose, with these moving lines. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for lift them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do, as syllable from sound. And so in that lofty spirit, I bring you President Proust's greetings on behalf of your colleagues in the Indiana Conference of Higher Education. 
We join you in this colorful and thrilling ceremony to wish you well in your leadership of this highly respected university. But even larger significance, we meet with you to renew our deep belief in the fundamental purposes of education. We meet with you to restate our belief in the essential relationship between those purposes and the maintenance of a free society. And we meet with you to reaffirm our conviction that the cultivation of the human intellect is man's finest expression of humanity. Ball State University and you, President Proust, have our felicitations and warm good wishes. Dr. Dr. Alan Rankin speaking from it, representing of course, the designated area. This is Edmund F. Ball, Thank a descendant of the Ball brothers, Reagan, representing uh, Yale University, I'm 1701, sure founded I at that time. I speak on behalf of both the trustees and President Bruce, when um, we're particularly grateful for your comments about uh, what can be expected in the days ahead. <laughs> we'll, <coughs> we'll both realize what may be coming. <laughs> And we are highly honored uh, to have with us today the chief executive of our state. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you the Honorable Edgar D. Whitcomb, Governor of the State of Indiana. Governor Whitcomb. And our audience appropriately standing for the governor. An attorney at law from Seymour, Indiana, took office in January of this year after serving as Secretary of State. College and university presidents, delegates, faculty members, students and alumna of Ball State, and friends. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to welcome President Proust to participate in this inauguration ceremony. I want to tell all of you I want to tell you, Dr. Hunkerford, Dr. Hannaford, I want to tell you that the state of Indiana is very much aware of the needs for education, the needs for money in this state. I want to tell all of you that this administration has seen the amount to be spent for education during these next two years increased by 16% over the past two years. We want to see much greater increases. I'm happy to state, President Proust, that we are working on a program by which we expect to provide for the first time in the state of Indiana some $50 million for student scholarships and student loans which we feel will be very helpful in meeting the responsibilities of this state in education. I am deeply aware that the success of this administration, the success and the future of the state of Indiana depends upon quality education in the state of Indiana. And I repeat my pledge to do everything to promote that effort in this state. Dr. Proust comes to Ball State University succeeding one of Indiana's outstanding educators, President Emeritus Emmons. We salute him for the work he has done. And on behalf of the people of this great state, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. John J. Proust as president of Ball State University. Thank you.
At this time, I would like to introduce the other members of the Ball State Board of Trustees who are uh, on the platform. And after they're introduced, why then um, uh, you may wish to salute them. On my right, Ms. Thelma Ballard, please rise, and Mr. George Stevens. Ms. Ballard is from Marion, Mr. Stevens from Plymouth. On my left, Mr. Floyd Hines from Connersville, and Richard Wells, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, ex officio a member of our Board of Trustees. Now, Our um, gathering here today to install a new president, Ball State, certainly marks a milestone in the life of this institution. Since its founding by generous and public-spirited citizens uh, just 51 years ago, it has grown from a small college limited to one sphere of higher education, teacher education, to the university which we know today. And surely measured by any yardstick, be it physical plant, scope of the curriculum, caliber of its faculty, or quality, number of students, it has enjoyed outstanding growth. And certainly many factors have played a part in making this possible, but to mention just a few, um, I think first the, the good support which Ball State has received over this half century from all the citizens of Indiana through the state appropriations. And also by the loyal support of alumni and faculty members and students and their parents. And also the continued generous and cooperative assistance by the people of this community. And of course, something which has had a tremendous impact has been John R. Emmons, who for 23 years as a president of this institution has furnished the vision and the imagination and the faith in the future and the knowledge and always a steadfast determination and great leadership so that today Ball State takes its place among the great universities of our country. As Dr. Hannaford mentioned, we, we reached this point just at a moment in our history when colleges and universities are the prime targets of the discontented. And so it makes these very trying days and very testing days for academic leadership everywhere. And certainly for the man who assumes the presidency of Ball State. And it's a task which is going to demand all of his energies. To reminisce just a minute, it seems to me that Ball State in the past has shown wisdom and courage to mark out its own mission in education and work unfailingly for the best quality possible in its chosen field. Now, inevitably, this, this mission has broadened, and it'll continue to broaden with the passage of years. But I think Ball State has retained its values and its quality of academic environment and I think that this we must preserve, even as our mission in education broadens. Surely today much more is expected of universities and colleges than ever before. Not only must they be centers of learning, but they also must accumulate knowledge. They must transmit it, as they have in the past, which has been their more or less historical function, but today, the university must itself be a generator of knowledge, and if you please, a generator of change. It must meet the challenge of the new science, and the new economics, the new politics, uh, the new world. Well, these are tremendous challenges, and I think that to meet them, Ball State is tremendously fortunate to have as its seventh president, John J. Proust. Let me speak just briefly of his choice as president and of the more than two years which went into the search culminating in his selection. First, I would like to express the appreciation on the, on the 
uh, on behalf of every member of the Board of Trustees, to the members of the Presidential Selection Advisory Committee to the Trustees, for their thorough and untiring efforts and invaluable efforts in the quest for the President, and also in their continuing advice and cooperation. John Pruce is a native of Michigan, having been born and reared near Holland. And I think it's fair to say that education is a tradition in his family for his father taught in the public schools of Michigan. He graduated from the Holland High School in 1940 and then entered Western Michigan University for his undergraduate studies. These were interrupted by three years of active duty in the United States Navy. He now holds the rank of captain in the United States Naval Reserve on inactive duty. In other words, John was born prior to World War II. <laughs> His baccalaureate degree was received in 1947 from Western Michigan University, where his major studies were in the field of speech. In the four years which followed, John Pruce earned two graduate degrees. In 1949, he became Master of Arts in Speech Education at Northwestern University, and in 1951, he earned his Doctorate of Philosophy from Northwestern University. He then went to the University of Northern Iowa for one year as an instructor in speech, followed by three years at Southern Illinois University, first as an assistant professor and then an associate professor of speech. John Pruce was then called back to Western Michigan University, first as associate and then as professor of speech, followed by the appointment of Assistant Dean of the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences. In 1961, John Proust took the next step in his career when he accepted the appointment of Administrative Assistant to the President of Western Michigan University. And in 1964, he was elected Secretary of the Board of Trustees of that university, and in 66 was appointed Vice President for Administration of Western Michigan University. Well, in addition to his regular duties, John Pruce has been a productive scholar, a contributor to scholarly periodicals, a sought-after speaker. He's served, or is serving, in various capacities, several of the major educational associations in the United States. And he has been active in civic and philanthropic organizations in Kalamazoo, his former home. As you know, he resides at the present in the Ball State President's home, 25 Meadow Lane in Muncie, with his charming wife, Angeline, and their two younger sons, Daniel and Dirk, who are both students at Burris Laboratory School, and David, their eldest, who is a junior at Western Michigan University. Well, I think, I, I think you can see that by education, by training, by experience, ability, personality, to name a few, Dr. Pruce is preeminently qualified to undertake the assignment upon which he now formally enters. He's come to a momentous step in his distinguished career, the assumption of the leadership of this vital, thriving, emerging university. It will not be an easy charge to coordinate and guide the efforts of a talented and vigorous group of men and women comprising faculty, students, and administrators, all toward the fulfillment of their legitimate aspirations and individual potentials, and in so doing, maintain an institution which meet, need, uh, meets the needs of many, but in which no individual feels lost and submerged. In short, Mr. President, so that Ball State will be recognized as a school of good learning. I found that phrase in a recent book by Robert McNamara, The Essence of Security. And I quote the paragraph where it, Mr. McNamara uses it. He says, the education of the young is unfortunately never a detailed roadmap, but rather a passport into a dense wood filled with forked roads. 
But in schools of good learning, the younger generation, if they choose wisely, will find the time spent there to be a rewarding journey. It will be a discovery. What they will discover is not that there is an unbridgeable gap between the generations, but rather those truths which we all, young or old alike, seek to know who we are and whose wood this is in which we walk. In this great venture or this journey, which John Proust is now embarking upon, he certainly will need the understanding, the cooperation, and the patience of all who work with him. And I'm confident that I speak for the entire Ball State University family when I pledge to you, Mr. President, our wholehearted support in the fulfillment of your duties and responsibilities. John J. Proust, as President of the Board of Trustees of Ball State University, I have the honor to invest you with the title and with the office of president of Ball State University, with the sure knowledge that you will fulfill the obligations of this office to the best of your ability. As a symbol of your office, President Emeritus John R. Emmons will present the presidential medallion. Thank you, Mr. Bracken. It's a very distinct honor to be invited as a representative of the Board of Trustees and the faculty and administration, the student body, the alumni, and all the friends and supporters of Ball State University to make this presentation. President John J. Proust, let me assure you that I am most happy and pleased to place this medallion upon your shoulders. <laughs> medallion symbolizing all the honors and the privileges and the responsibilities that are yours as the seventh president of Ball State University. Now, we're confident you will wear the medallion with pride on all appropriate occasions, and that you will bring to the institution which you now serve honor and distinction. And to you and to Angie, Aline and I extend our hearty congratulations and our sincere best wishes. Thank you, Jack. The presidential medallion was created by the University Senate, and the first one was presented to Dr. Emmons some time ago. I might mention that Dr. Emmons is uh, leaving for Spain, we understand, shortly after uh, today's ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, it, was, it is a privilege and an honor to present to you the seventh president of Ball State University, Dr. Bruce. Um, Mr. Chairman, Governor Whitcomb, trustees of Ball State University, other honored members of the platform party, members of the faculty, students and staff, officials of the state of Indiana, distinguished representatives, ladies and gentlemen. With great pride in the opportunity and with great and deep humility in the realization of the responsibility, I accept the office formally conferred upon me this day. All of you honor this institution by your presence, and we thank you. It is sobering indeed to realize that I have been asked to follow in the line of those who have served with distinction as president of Ball State University. William Parsons, Linnaeus Hines, Benjamin Burris, Lemuel Pittenger, Winfred Wagoner, and for 23 distinguished years, John R. Emmons, who I am most pleased is present on this platform today. These men all gave fully and freely of themselves to the de development of a college 
now a university, known much more widely than its years or its size might seem to warrant. While it was not my privilege to know any other than President Emeritus Emmons, I am confident that all of them would have agreed with him that this development was not their task alone, but a cooperative effort of trustees, faculty, students, staff, state officials, and friends. May this continue in its fullest sense. This program is basically ceremonial in nature. It rightly reminds us of the values and accomplishments of the past. But if it does not fix our eyes on the future, it will have been only a pleasant, though substantively meaningless, pause in our busy lives. Governor Whitcomb, Chairman Bracken, and the others have already ensured against this by their words, and I shall attempt to do the same. The formal inauguration of any president, of any organization or institution, provides a natural opportunity to look ahead to that which must be and that which might be. These I have chosen to call imperatives and opportunities. Our first imperative is common to all institutions in society. It is easily and frequently spoken. We even address ourselves to it with some degree of regularity, though perhaps too wearisomely or perfunctorily all too often. And yet, it serves as the cornerstone of every future. It is, simply, a sense of mission. What is it that we seek to accomplish? What are our goals? We are rightly proud of our university's past, and we are indebted to all those who have brought us to this point in our history. But should we not examine anew the question of just what is to be the role of Ball State University in the years ahead? All of higher education, indeed all of our society, is aware of the winds of change, discontent, and disillusionment, of the awesome array of unresolved problems and unmet needs which confront us at seemingly every turn. How shall we at Ball State University conduct ourselves in the midst of all this? Should we, can we attempt to be all things to all people? Will we allow ourselves to be lured down every promising academic trail and even some not so promising simply because we are a university and we claim the world as our domain? It is my hope that we will carefully examine ourselves and resolve to focus our efforts on those elements of ignorance and incomplete knowledge, those elements of unfulfilled promise, those elements of potential for good, which we are uniquely qualified to explore and in which we have genuine interest. This will then permit us to marshal our talents and our resources for specific and attainable purposes. The student who comes to us will thus know that we are addressing ourselves to certain goals and that he can expect to find opportunity here to pursue his own interests within this framework under the guidance of a faculty and staff dedicated to certain propositions. Always important a sense of mission is essential today, the sine qua non, if you will. If our university community is to contribute to the resolution of the host of ills which mark the human condition, and that it must. Archibald MacLeish has said, what has always held our nation together and what must hold our universities together is an ideal, a dream, if you will, a large and abstract thought of the sort that the realists, the pragmatists, and the sophisticated may reject, but that which humankind can hold to. Growing directly out of a sense of mission is a second imperative. 
recognition of the environment in which we live and the university's role in that environment. The university once existed, or at least was thought to exist, as an ivory tower, quite completely secluded and removed from the social, political, and economic issues of the day. Obviously, it is no longer possible to carry this myth within us. The so-called objective pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, by scholars on both sides of the lectern, has long since been unmasked. All of the revered thinkers of the past sought to organize theory and knowledge in ways which would advance society in preconceived directions. Philosophic scholarly activity from its earliest days was interwoven both openly and subtly with social goals. The same general condition obtained in the early days of science, the noble development of empiricism as the objective way to determine truth in the physical world, for example, was not allowed to follow its own course. Galileo's magnificent efforts to cite just one instance were not allowed free reign, but rather were circumscribed by the rulers of his day. On this stage earlier this year, many of us heard playwright Barry Stavis's Galileo say in Lamp at Midnight, do not be afraid. Only small people need fear the large truth. Must the universe be smooth, round, and comfortably, comfortably small for us to be happy in it? Man is not measured by the size of his habitation, but by the understanding of his soul. Let man penetrate the secrets of nature. Each new law of nature learned, each new law of nature learned by man will be additional proof of the infinite greatness and infinite wisdom of God. We know, however, that he was not permitted to continue his work freely, but was forced finally to deny his own self and his knowledge of the universe. Even in our enlightened day, with the meteoric rise of research in all fields, some heretofore untouched by formalized patterns of investigation, the hypothesis frequently stands as the magical gate opener for him who would receive the support or even the permission to pursue his search for further knowledge. All of this becomes the more significant when we realize that it is knowledge that serves as the chief source of power today, in contrast to land and capital in bygone years. The research and development sections of the giants and the midgets in both business and industry, the brain trusts in government, the advisory councils in our social agencies, the computer services which are being utilized by nearly every organization, and the incredible increase in the percentage of our citizenry engaged in some form of formal education all attest to this fact. Yet the question which must be asked is, have the university and its sponsors, both public and private, really recognized this new and central role of knowledge in our environment? I fear the answer is no, or at least, not enough. Within the universities and colleges, we continue to adore the tradition that the prime purpose of academe is to transmit the culture and to extend the horizons of our knowledge through free inquiry, untempered by relationship and responsibility to the world in which we live. We claim immunity from the implications of our programs charging that it is the responsibility of others to make such application of the results of our efforts as seem appropriate and applicable to the problems of the real world. And there is much to be said for this position, for otherwise our efforts, too, should always have to begin with a judgment of exactly what is needed at any given time. It is much more palatable to view the university as a place where political or social or economic considerations are put aside in favor of an unbiased examination of all issues. Yet we are faced with the indisputable fact that all but a minute amount of support for our programs, both financial and moral, comes from an expectation that desirable effects 
will result. Desirable in that they will support predetermined and acceptable ends. The volatile radicalism so prevalent in all of society today, and especially that found on our several campuses, speaks precisely to this point. Today's disenchanted are saying, in large part, your goals are specious. You seek only to maintain. You are not responding to needs as they exist. Now, if the above is reasonably correct, we must ask what the university can do to be more responsible, indeed, to endure. Benson Snyder, a psychiatrist, recently said, the individual who holds tightly to the model of his world and finds that that model no longer works often becomes furious at anyone who points out that events have changed. He has stopped listening. In applying this observation to the college and to society, Dr. Snyder added, the climate in the college and the society becomes suffused and astray, positions ossified, and one hears expressions of helplessness increase. Like dinosaurs on the plains of mud, each in his own way frantically puts on more weight and thinks this form of strength will serve him. He doesn't know he has lost touch until the mud reaches the level of his eye. President James Dixon of Antioch College, in reacting to this statement, spoke volumes when he said, we are full of the tragedy of not hearing. We need somehow to loosen up on our models of education in relationship to ourselves and the world to get room enough to be human. Do we listen to anyone but ourselves? And if we do try to listen, do we genuinely seek to understand? Or do we dismiss all other voices as unsophisticated or even pernicious rumblings of the uninformed and the obstructionist or the destructionist? More specifically, do we in higher education really listen to the cries for a more relevant, more viable program of undergraduate studies? Or do we prefer to shut our ears while repeating our long revered incantations to the traditional liberal arts and the specialized studies? Do we seriously consider the pleas for more individualized programs of graduate studies? Or do we continue to praise our abilities to organize tightly knit curricula leading to this or that degree so that advising becomes little more than a simple checkoff system? Are we interested in striving with our students for a true synthesizing of learning? Or do our specialized interests drive us ever toward self-reproduction with only the slightest mutations permitted on occasion by special dispensation? Are we intellectually and psychologically prepared to test every single assumption of the nature of the learning process? Or do we only reluctantly admit the introduction of new methods to our way of academic life? In our great and worthy present day concern for the proper form of university governance, are we examining the problem from the perspective of its overall purpose and function? Or do we seek only to protect and advance our own private interest, whichever our class? The incredible acceleration of knowledge, communication, and transportation has not, as some would have it, created new problems for our society. It has only raised to the threshold of perception conflicts and paradoxes which have long existed. As the primary agency for understanding the human condition, the university must face up to the realities of the world in which we live and redefine its role in that environment so that we may yet overcome our problems. This brings us to a third imperative. Intellectual independence for all. Historian Arnold Toynbee observed in a recent essay, the traditional form of education 
was an authoritarian indoctrination of a pupil by a certified instructor. The content of the education was a fixed and limited body of knowledge, or supposed knowledge, that was assumed by both pupil and teacher to be guaranteed to be immutable truth. The implication is, of course, that education cannot be limited to the acquisition of a given number of bits of information. For history reveals, especially in recent years, that today's fact may become tomorrow's falsehood. Of greater importance is the ability to identify problems, analyze data, and draw conclusions. Dostoevsky stated what he called the eternal question. What do you believe, or don't you believe at all? It is the contention of many students today, if I hear them accurately, that they are not required, let alone encouraged, to answer this essential question. Rather, they say, they are required in their classes to respond in prescribed ways if they hope to gain the blessing of the instructor. And that, of course, is in the form of an acceptable grade. Now, this is not to suggest that every answer is to be accepted equally. But it does seem, if we accept Mr. Toynbee's premise, that no one of us can lay claim to possess the truth with respect to our most perplexing problems. If we will but remember that many of yesterday's answers have been dislodged by today's knowledge, we should be ready to place more emphasis on the process of independent learning. Doing this, we will lead not only our students, but also ourselves to toward intellectual independence. The last imperative which I wish to place before us is at once the simplest and the most complex. It is not new, but it is painfully obvious that we have yet to recognize its importance or that we have yet to find within ourselves the willingness to live with its realization. And that is the need to believe in and to live as the family of man. Former religious news editor of the New York Times, Mr. John Cogley, in an address at the University of North Carolina last year stated, racism, nationalism, religious exclusivism, the division of the world into villains and heroes, superior and inferior kinds of men, into our own kind and foreigners, the spurious divisions of the past are already conspicuously beside the point, though many of us do not yet realize it. It is now brutally evident the path of exclusivism is the road to suicide. Most of us can and do accept this intellectually, but it is also true, I fear, that we do not yet live by this belief we too frequently fail to recognize the implications of our beliefs and our convictions. It is imperative that the university be concerned with what is now being called personhood. We speak in our publications and in our utterances of personalized attention, interest in the individual, and a host of other intentions to recognize each and every person as a human being. Yet we, at times, both in the university and in society, go about our tasks from day to day as if we alone, ourselves individually, exist. Once more, we are full of the tragedy of not hearing. The violence which fills our world is the direct result. I am optimistic enough to believe that while the hour is late, there is yet enough time to awaken and to listen to each other. If we will but approach our common problems together with an air of mutual respect, we can solve them. Increased and improved education has given rise to the widest assessment of human problems ever known. Surely this same education can be successfully directed toward the resolution of these problems if we are willing to admit our fellow human beings, all of them, to full membership in the family of man. History reminds us that too many societies have been unwilling to do so. 
Quoting from last spring's social science symposium held on this campus, are we moving forward, however awkwardly and haltingly, arm in arm into a brighter tomorrow, a braver and newer world than we presently inhabit? Or are we marching in a kind of lockstep, either toward an Armageddon, or more probably, toward a condition of unrelieved dreariness and drabness, in which our present unpleasant tendencies will have become irreversibly institutionalized and the bright hope of the individual has been extinguished. These four observations have been termed imperatives. I would hope that we might agree that they are. If we do agree, we must so pattern the work of this university that they become central to our every task. It will then follow that some splendid opportunities will be ours. The true task of education, according to Bertrand Russell, is to give a sense of value of things other than domination, to help create wise citizens in a free community. And through the combination of citizenship with liberty in individual creativeness, to enable men to give a human life that splendor which some few have shown that it can achieve. Grand thought? Indeed. Subject to different interpretations? Of course. But attainable? Yes. One of the happier letters, totally unsolicited, to cross my desk since my arrival here was written by one of our graduate students. In commenting on two of his Ball State University professors, this student said, in part, Dr. X exhibited an interest and enthusiasm in the subject matter, the course, and the students. His lectures elicited response, involvement, exchange. There was no letter writing in the back row. Sooner or later, each student's philosophy or attitude, academic discipline or role, came under scrutiny. However errant the students' remarks, Dr. X dealt with them respectfully, considering each as a contribution worthy of concern. He worked hard at it. He taught some school. This autumn quarter, the student went on, I was enrolled in the number of the course taught by Dr. Y. He could not have faced a sadder prospect. At 6.30 p.m., he stood before some 20 doctoral fellows, commuting principals, and full-time teachers, all of them bone-weary from grading themes, violating frogs, amassing bibliographies, organizing bus runs, organizing labs, and dick and janing it. Some of them hungry, some of them sleepy, all of them tired. I don't know how he did it, but he did. By the close of the fourth week, we were volunteering to make special or extra preparations in areas of special interest. Sometime after the sixth week, several members of that same worn mass of humanity regularly retired with Dr. Y to the student union to continue, to clarify, to get something straight. Dr. Y had made students of us. He worked hard at it. He taught some school. Well, these two professors and this student made full utilization of the opportunity for this university to be a place of learning. And if the truth were known, I suspect that these professors found as much joy in this learning as did the student. They might, in fact, say with Solon of Athens, as I grow old, I keep on teaching myself many new things. This is an opportunity I would wish for us all. Mutual acceptance of the imperatives which are ours presents us with the opportunity to change some of our ways from time to time. We seldom pause to realize that the pattern of our academic life was created by men like ourselves, though in a different day and time. The 50-minute hour, the frequency of class meetings, lecturing, course loads, the credit hour, grading, degree requirements, class sizes, all these and many more have traditionally been accepted as established and enduring academic truths. Historian William R. Hutchinson put it succinctly when he said, the prevailing motto in our universities continues to be nihil sine orationibus. If you haven't had a lecture course in it, you haven't learned it. 
All too frequently, we struggle to defend the existing pattern of the university life rather than to admit to its possible inadequacies and to set about to develop more satisfactory ways of educating our students and conducting our institutional lives and work. The eminent philosopher Pogo was nothing short of profound when he observed, I have seen the enemy and he is us. <laughs> In the final analysis, we are judged by our results and not by our ways. If we choose to do so, we can try new methods, provided only that we satisfy ourselves and the academic community of which we are a part, that the changes we propose give promise of enabling us to achieve our goals more satisfactorily. Admittedly, the challenge to change has produced frustration and more in those whose proposals have not been accepted. That is the risk we always face. Though most of us openly advocate change as a hope for improvement, we must recognize that change is often threatening, even painful to contemplate. We are at best reluctant to do away with old and familiar patterns, so the battle may be hard. Let us make certain of only one thing, and that is that we too do not get caught up in the argument over the shape of the conference table around which we gather to discuss our plans. Let us always deal with the central issue. If we are able to demonstrate that we can deal with our own problems intelligently and constructively, I am certain that another significant opportunity is ours, namely, the maintaining of our autonomy and our distinctiveness. Clark Kerr recently noted, it is the best of times and the worst of times for higher education and each could not be without the other. It is a season of success, and it is also a season of despair, and they are the same season. There are those who would seek to rule us from outside the university. This must not be allowed to happen, for it would destroy the university as we know it and have known it, as it serves and has served. Through high standards of purpose and self-expectation and through rigorous effort to live up to these standards, we can continue to be a place where the pursuit of truth and the advancement of learning can exist without domination by outside influences. In these remarks, I realize that questions have been raised at least as often as answers have been suggested but that is proper in a university setting. Our main task is not to proclaim what we conceive to be the correct answers. Rather, we must always strive to ask the right questions, thereby leading ourselves and others to increasingly better answers. And each of us must decide for himself how he will approach his tasks. For myself, I shall strive to follow the admonition of the prophet Micah, who in response to the question, and what does the Lord require of thee, answered, to love mercy, to do justly, and to walk humbly with thy God. May each of us be rededicated this day to his own credo. It will strengthen not only ourselves, but our university. John Macefield at the University of Sheffield in 1946 said, there are few earthly things more beautiful than a university. It is a place where those who hate ignorance may strive to know, where seekers and learners alike banded together in the search for knowledge will honor thought in all its finer ways will welcome thinkers in distress or in exile, will uphold ever the dignity of thought and learning, and will exact standards in these things. They give to the young in their impressionable years the bond of a loftier purpose shared, of a great corporate life whose links will not be loosed until they die. 
They give young people that close companionship for which youth longs. And that chance of the endless discussion of the themes which are endless, without which youth would seem a waste of time. There are few earthly things more splendid than a university. In these days of broken frontiers and collapsing values, when the dams are down and the floods are making misery, when every future looks somewhat grim and every ancient foothold has become something of a quagmire, wherever a university stands, it stands and shines. Wherever it exists, the free minds of men urged on to full and fair inquiry may still bring wisdom into human affairs. In this magnificent statement lie both the imperatives and the opportunities of Ball State University. I freely pledge myself to these noble goals and earnestly solicit your participation in their accomplishment. A few moments ago, we were able to identify Mrs. Proust. There you see her again at the left of your screen, and now they're standing, and she may be covered by them there in the Proust party, along with their sons, and uh, that entire area there. We're sorry, we can't get closer to it to give you a better view, but there's Mr. Proust, Mrs. Proust, just to the right of the gentleman with the academic dress, the, the mortarboard. choir will perform again for us now. Boston State University Concert Choir in the last words of David.
here is Dr. Uh, Richard Richard W. Burkhardt, Dr. Richard W. Burkhardt, Vice President for Instructional Affairs and Dean of Faculties, seated down there in the audience. <clears throat> Dr. George W. Jones, the Director of Religious Programs at Ball State University, will give the benediction. If the audience will please rise for the benediction, and then you may be seated during the recessional. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling short of our visions and commitments, from corrupting the tasks which have been given to us, from misusing the knowledge and skills we have gained, and from robbing those with whom we are associated of their dignity and humanity, be all praise, glory, majesty, and authority, both now and forevermore, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, we'd like to compliment Alexander M. Bracken, President of the Ball State University Board of Trustees and Chairman for today for an excellent job down there on that platform and a relatively strange circumstance and most tense situation for anyone. He's corporate vice president for Ball Brothers Company here in Muncie, Indiana. Well, those 14 chairs empty very quickly as the Ball State University Symphony Orchestra now continues to perform with the recessional. One or two things we'd like to mention here. First of all, the awesome responsibility of being a president today has fallen to John J. Proust, and it has grown enormously over the years. For example, the budget for the 1965-67 biennium was a little over $19 million. The budget for the 1969-71 biennium was a little over $35 million, and that's almost double. And so on April 12, 1946, the inaugurational ceremony held with John R. Emmons, 23 years, one day ago today, also on Friday. President Emeritus Emmons was then 44. Uh, President John Proust turned 45 in December of this past year. With the benediction of Dr. George W. Jones, we bring to a close the inauguration of Dr. John J. Proust, Ball State University's seventh president. This program has been a special production. The Center for Radio and Television, Ball State University, Dr. William H. Tomlinson, Director. Our special thanks to Earl Williams, manager of Emmons Auditorium, and Robert Jolliffe, technician of Emmons Auditorium, to Dr. Richard Kohlemeyer, assistant to the president, to Marie Frazier and her fine staff of public information services, especially to Al Rent and Dorothy Fisher, to Mr. Garvin Phillips and his television technical staff, and to Mr. John Iden, graphic artist, both of the Center for Radio and Television, and also to our television production staff. Inauguration of Dr. John J. Bruce, was directed by David C. Stout. Their narrator is Dara Weibel.